want to welcome everybody to our fifth in our webinar series. I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center. As many of you know, uh, Ashbrook is an independent educational center located here at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. And we sponsor programs around the country for students, teachers, and citizens. And I particularly want to extend, as we always do, a welcome to our teachers who are joining us uh, through our Teaching American History project, which is a, a great outreach and program to empower teachers to help their students uh, think, discover and think through the enduring questions of American history and civics. So welcome to teachers, welcome to friends, welcome to supporters from around the country. As I said, this is the fifth webinar in our series uh, called, which we're calling Insights from History. Our, our first one was with Dr. Uh, Jennifer Keen on the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Our second one, as you may recall, was on presidential leadership in times of crisis with Dr. Steve Knott of the United States uh, Naval War College. Our third was on the economic consequences of emergency government intervention and with Dr. Steve Hayward of the University of California, Berkeley. And of course, last week, we were delighted and privileged to have Dr. Joe Fornieri with us to talk about civil liberties in times of emergency. And as you can see by the title, Insights from History, it's really our part of our mission here at Ashbrook to engage the past. You know, we think of ourselves as helping to strengthen constitutional self-government in America by educating our fellow Americans in the history and principles of our country. And we think this uh, series fits wonderfully into that mission. We really believe that you can learn from history, that we have to learn from history, that it gives us historical perspective on times of crisis like we face today, but it also renews our understanding of America and of American principles. And we've seen that in the various webinars that we've held so far in all their aspects, and I know we're gonna see that today here with Dr. Lauren Hall. And this is this webinar series and the conversation we're gonna to have today, as I've said before, is really part of the what we call the Ashbrook way of teaching and learning. We don't think of education as just information, and we don't think of education, certainly, we don't think of it as indoctrination. We think of it as discovery, as discovering for yourself the truth about America, its history, and its principles. We operate on the old principle that goes all the way back to Aristotle. All people desire to know, but we always add, but they don't want to be told. They want to learn it and discover it for themselves. And so we're going to do that today with Dr. Lauren Hall. We're going to have a conversation. So I want to welcome all of you to that conversation, encourage you to ask questions um, th through the functions there that you have on, uh, on your technology to send those in to us. And we will try and get to as many of those as possible and integrate them into the conversation that we're having. We're gonna ask the past questions today. <laughs> We've got some wonderful readings. Primary source documents is the way that Ashbrook engages the past, not with textbooks, but with the sources themselves from the great minds and great people of the past who can help us learn from the past. We seek the answers of the past. We regard history as a form of inquiry, asking questions, thinking through the answers, and trying to discover the truth for ourselves. And today we're gonna to have a conversation on the American family in times of crisis, education, healthcare, and the trade-offs of coming home. As you know, we're joined today by Dr. Lauren Hall. Dr. Hall is Associate Professor of Political Science at Rochester Institute of Technology, a colleague of Dr. Fornieri's, who was with us last week. Um, she has her BA from the State University of New York at Binghamton and her PA, MA and PhD from Northern Illinois University. She's a professor in Ashbrook's Teaching American History and Master's of arts in American history and government programs. So she's been a longtime colleague of ours, friend of ours, and teacher in our programs. She teaches uh, in Ashbrook courses, she's taught classes like the American Founding and the Progressive Era. And then at 
Rochester, she's taught classes, and I think even this semester um, was teaching classes called Politics and the Life Sciences. And um, a great title, I love this one, Anarchy, Technology, and Utopia. Boy, is that appropriate <laughs> for, for today. <laughs> She's written many scholarly works, um, articles and book chapters on important political thinkers and historical figures like Edmund Burke, Adam Smith, and of course, work on the United States Constitution as well. She's got a number of books, a couple of which deserve mention. A couple of my favorites. One is called Family and the Politics of Moderation, Private Life, Public Goods, and the Rebirth of Social Individualism. And a lot of those family themes, of course, we're gonna be talking about with Dr. Hall today. And her most recent book, a really interesting subject, has just been published called The Medicalization of Birth and Death. And it's been published by Johns Hopkins University Press, which as many of you know, is one of the foremost um, universities for medical sciences and, and medicine. And Dr. Hall has just published this book on the medicalization of birth and death. And I think that's another subject that we're gonna get into today, in the place of the family in things like birth and even death. Um, I was just talking with Dr. Hall before we got underway here and telling me she's got three young children. So she's experiencing <laughs> the effects of the, our situation today and its effect on home life um, personally. And uh, Lauren, you were saying that your husband is uh, in the United States Army Reserves and has been involved lately in mobilization. That's, that was very interesting to me. Can you say something about that? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, he was in Fort, he was stationed at Fort Bliss for the last year. He just returned to us in February um, and just in the nick of time to step in and help me <laughs> with uh, as this uh, crisis sort of came to a head. Um, that was definitely a, a learning experience on the importance of family for us. We had my my husband was gone. I had three young children. I was working full time as a faculty member, uh, but we are absolutely blessed to have two both sets of grandparents living in town. Um, and so that it has really been a, um, a sort of village effort, an intergenerational compact, as you might say, for those of us who follow Edmund Burke, um, in trying to keep the children alive and uh, and myself uh, sane. So um, we are very happy that he's home, and um, and there was some inkling that he was going to be potentially mobilized again to deal with some of the coronavirus uh, situation down in uh, New York City. But fortunately, um, that does not seem to be the case. So we're Hopefully he's home for the long term now. That, that's good news, very good news. But it, it does draw attention to the fact, um, we were joking about this before, that a, a subtitle for this, or an alternative title for this webinar could be, help, we're all homeschoolers now. <laughs> <laughs> and because this current crisis really has people talking again about the role of the American family in, in our lives. Kids are at home, right? Parents are at home. Some trying to work, some just trying to help out. Grandparents are affected by this. That home and family life just now seems so different than even three months ago. So much more different than we could have really imagined. But you know, sometimes we forget that the way our families were functioning you know, in January of 2020 is not always the way they've been functioning in America. That, that this is a, a particular moment in American history. And I'm just wondering if we could start out by Talking a little bit about the American family, take us back in time a little bit in American history to the American family, let's say at the time of the American founding. And I know we have a reading um, by the very famous uh, French political thinker, Alexis de Tocqueville, who came to America to observe democracy and see what this new thing in the world was. And he did that way back in the, in the early 1800s. But I'm wondering if you could start us, take us back to that time Tocqueville talks about the effect that democracy has had on the American family as he sees it in the early 19th century. I would love to. First of all, thank you so much for having me and thank you for, uh, for uh, hosting these wonderful webinars. They've been fantastic. Um, so Tocqueville is, you know, his, his primary sort of um, interest in the family and, and of course he, he's interested in, in looking at the way that democracy as a sort of political ideal affects a variety of social institutions. So 
he's sort of a proto-sociologist as well as a political theorist. He's very interested in sort of these broad cultural and social changes that will come as a result of the ideological commitment to equality. And that's really what he sees as driving democracy is, is a commitment to equality. And so one of the things that you see coming out um, of democracy and the way that it influences the family, and the family, of course, in turn influences the, um, the political sphere, is a commitment to a, a sort of more egalitarian form of family life. Now, the reason for this, of course, is uh, that there's a, there's a pretty concrete mechanism that Tocqueville points to, and that's the institution of property. And so in the aristocratic form of the family, the goal is not necessarily, or the primary sort of goal of the family is not necessarily the well-being of children or even the well-being of the family unit itself. It's the preservation of property lines and social status over the centuries. And so from Tocqueville's perspective, aristocracy is an inherently conservative or backward looking institution. Its goal is to preserve the past and bring it into the future, but its, its goal is not progress in any, kind of, um, in any kind of real way. And as part of that, uh, you see a real commitment to authority and authoritarian structures in aristocratic families. In particular, the father is the head of the household. His, uh, his will is absolute in that kind of way. Um, and there's a very clear hierarchy even within the siblings of the family. You have the father and then you have the eldest son uh, that's usually enforced with legal uh, requirements like um, the requirement that the eldest son inherit the entire estate because that's the only way to preserve that property and social status over the generations. And, uh, and so you have this very authoritarian system with a lot of emphasis on the father and the eldest son. In, and there's a kind of formality to this hierarchy that limits the amount of emotional intimacy that family members can, can have with one another. And so what Tocqueville finds when he comes to, to America is a totally different kind of family. And I think it's most clearly described when he, he, ref, he, he refers to it as free, familiar, and tender in the way that the son addresses his father. And so we have cast off this sort of, this authoritarianism. And part of that is because we don't have this landed property to worry about anymore. Um, and so we're not, because we're not linked to, because the needs of property no longer come first, uh, there's, a, there's an egalitarianism both between the father and the son, but also with the siblings. And so the other thing that he sees are the habits of living that democratic peoples have with each other as family members. And so those habits of living include the fact that you are out there in the fields with your brothers and sisters, you are out there with your father, uh, and you're engaged in the same kinds of labor and the same kinds of goals. And so that kind of intimate working together creates these, um, these common, this sympathy that he, that he describes. And it's worth noting too, that this is a really common theme at this time. Um, Adam Smith, for example, talks about the importance of sympathy in the family. Um, and one of his criticisms of boarding schools actually, and we might talk about this later, um, is that boarding schools destroy the sympathy between siblings. And so you're sending children off at a time that they should be engaged in these habits, these familial habits with the people that they love, building that intimacy together. So Tocqueville sees a really dramatically different kind of family emerge from, from democracy. It's, it's egalitarian, it's focused on the present and the future as opposed to the past. There's much less authoritarianism and much more of a focus on sympathy. And as a result, parents involved are involved much less in orders, giving direct orders to their children, and what uh, Tocqueville calls counsel. Right? And so he has this beautiful line, he says, uh, about the father. He says, his orders would perhaps be unrecognized, but his advice is usually full of power. If he is not, uh, if he's not surrounded by official respect, his sons at least approach him with confidence. So even though we've lost that authority, we've gained the intimacy of trust. And so for, for Tocqueville, the, the democratic family is one that is bonded together by the trust of people who are intimate with each other, who feel sympathy with each other, and who are engaged in a common goal. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, at that period, it would have been farming or, or small business ownership or something like right. that. That's so interesting and so different. I mean, 
we, we tend to think of the families we have today as, well, this is just how the family always is. And what you're saying is Tocqueville saying, no, if, if you live in an aristocracy like the old world European countries, your family actually looks and feels and lives differently. And I, I was just struck by in the fourth paragraph of the reading that we have, just to read this about aristocracies. He says, in aristocracies, the father is not only the political head of the family, he is the organ of tradition the interpreter of customs, the arbiter of mores or, or habits and customs. You listen to him with deference. You approach him only with respect. And the love that you give him is always tempered by fear. And I, I couldn't help but think uh, that kind of family, it reminds me of uh, The Sound of Music, that, that musical and that movie where Captain Von Trapp seems like the ultimate uh, aristocratic father. I think he even blows the whistle to summon his children down and they have to line up. And it's not just because he's a military man, but because he is Captain Von Trapp. He lives in this opulent palace. He's an aristocrat. Um, and so the way he interacts with his family is so different than the way a democratic family interacts. Mm -hmm. And notice that Tocqueville is, he's, he's ambivalent about whether this shift to a sort of more companionate or more intimate uh, sympathetic family is good for society. But he says, I'm sure that it's good for individuals. And, and he, so I think that he, there are going to be trade-offs to these shifts between different kinds of, of families. But I think he's very clear, at least at the end of the piece that we read for today, that there's, there's a real benefit to individuals about feeling this sense of intimacy and trust with the people that they, uh, that they love and care about. Um, and that is one of the things that allows, and his, um, his description of sort of how um, a democratic uh, son, for example, discovers his independence. He doesn't have to sort of wrest control from his father uh, when, he, uh, when he comes into uh, his sort of maturity. It's, everyone sees it happening and everyone knows it's coming and it's really much more of a, of a sort of um, giving and taking and a gradual process. And so American boys and girls too, the, his discussions of, of the way that women are educated, I think is really important for this conversation as well, is that they are being trained for independence. Whereas in the aristocratic kind of understanding, you're being trained to fulfill a very specific social role, whether that role is that of uh, the eldest son, meaning the inheritor of the estate, or the younger son, which means you would typically go into the military or go into religious life. You had very clear paths that you would take. Whereas the goal for the democratic peoples is to prepare children for what happens, right? And you cannot predict what necessarily is going to happen in the future. So that independence is part of this process as well. That's so interesting. So can we talk a little bit then about, we have this democratic family that, as you say, is bound together by a kind of affection for each other, a kind of sympathy, but the kids are raised to be more independent thinking. And I think Tocqueville says, as you said, not just boys, but girls also. He actually says, I think in one part of his book, the strength of America is found in the strength of her women. And if America is a strong country, it's because American women are strong. Um, and I wondered, can you talk then a little bit about if we have this kind of family, how does it handle crisis? And we've had, because we've had so many crises since Tocqueville came, we have the Civil War. We, of course, we have World War I, World War II. What, what are the kind of characteristics and of course, crisis today? What kind of, um, how does the democratic family with those kind of characteristics, how does it handle crisis? Well, so I don't want to move us too far ahead too quickly, but I think this leads us beautifully into the Abigail Adams letter that we that we also chose for this piece, uh, because what you see in that letter is, in fact, a, a family in crisis. Um, so this is, of course, if you look at the background of this letter, um, the historical background, we're in 1777. Uh, the um, situation is very, very unclear for the um, for the colonists. Uh, they're at war. Um, uh, John Adams, of course, is is trying to uh, do everything he can in the first Congress. Um, he, of course, is under threat of being captured, right? I mean, there's all sorts of very serious concerns of, of his safety. Um, meanwhile, Abigail Adams is running a farm by herself. She has five young children that she's caring for, um, one of whom is her, uh, her niece. She's pregnant, um, and she's nearing the end of her pregnancy at this point. Inflation is going through the roof. They can't afford farm help. And so she's doing the vast majority of the farming. 
Uh, she's making all of their clothes. She's uh, making all of their wool because they can't afford these basic supplies. So this is a situation in which the family really, when, when the external crisis occurs, the family turns inward and it turns inward in this really foundational kind of way. And I think you see that with the role that Abigail plays um, in keeping the family up and running. And part of the reason I chose this particular letter, there's a series of letters that lead up to this one where she discusses um, her fears that she has lost the baby um, and, then, uh, and then the fact that she does in fact lose the baby. Um, I chose this one partially because it shows her just about two weeks after the stillbirth of their uh, last child, their daughter. Uh, they had both been really hoping for a daughter. They had been hoping for another, another little girl to join her and, uh, and their daughter, Nabby. Um, and so in this letter, what you see is just this really sort of, I mean, in, in a sense, she's the ideal Tocquevillian woman. She's the ideal sort of American woman. Uh, she's been educated in the way that if you look at Tocqueville's discussion of the way that uh, that American women are educated, she was encouraged to read philosophy and poetry. She was very well educated in, in literature and uh, politics, um, but she was also deeply rooted in faith and religion. And so when Tocqueville talks about the, the American, the, the way that American girls are educated, he says, first, they're given the use of their reason. And that's crucial because that's something he thinks that the European women are not taught. They're not taught to be independent thinkers. And he says, but then they're taught religion. They're taught the use of their faith. And so their faith and their reason inform each other throughout, the, throughout, these, uh, throughout these crises. And so I think you can see that really beautifully in the, in the um, Adams letter. So she has a stillborn daughter. Uh, sh her sisters, of course, come for the birth. Um, she, it's a multiple days labor. So this is something that she is laboring in. In fact, in one of the letters prior to this, she pauses in the middle of a contraction to, she pauses the letter and then comes back to writing it. So she's in labor while, t while writing letters to her husband. Wow, you mean um, she's actually interrupted in letter writing by giving birth? Yes, yep. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, uh, and then she just keeps going. So, um, so you see here this, and, and the letter itself moves seamlessly through a variety of themes that I think you see in the way that the American family internalizes these kinds of crises. So you have this extreme tragedy that she is obviously still suffering from. Her other letters are, are sometimes just despondent at the loss of this baby. Uh, the other children are deeply affected by this. And at the same time, she still has to pay attention to the loss at Ticonderoga. She still has to pay attention to rising inflation and the fact that there aren't enough farm workers. Um, and then she still manages to end on this note of optimism, a joke that actually plays from a letter that he had sent a few months before about when he returns to be a farmer, she can be a dairymaid, right? And the sort of ideal of a simpler life that they could have together if they weren't living in the midst of this, of this crisis. So I think it sort of demonstrates all of the, the, the beauty and complexity of what Tocqueville saw going on in this very new family form where, uh, and, and again, part of what's so new about it is that in, in Europe, at least aristocratic Europe, women wouldn't be capable of doing this degree of, of sort of independent labor because there was such a strict separation between education and manual labor. But here you have someone doing both of those things in, in every possible capacity, right? She's not just giving birth, she's keeping the farm going, she's haggling with merchants and doing all of the home economy. Uh, she's also um, uh, investing and uh, starting to, uh, to inquire about some land sales and things that will eventually set the Adams family up to, uh, for financial independence. So uh, this is just a, a Renaissance woman, and I think someone that, that Tocqueville sees as uniquely American. That's amazing because she's probably also at that same time making sure that her children get educated as well. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more then about a family like that in time of crisis, how are the children being educated? Are they, are they working with their mom out in the field and then also reading? Is she directing it? As you said before, we sometimes think of a person like John Adams. Well, he must have been a rich guy. He must have had a lot of servants. And you're saying that in this time, definitely not. Yeah, he actually, there's a few letters that Adams writes. Um, he, he wrote uh, one to Jefferson, for example, when he was, he, he was desperate to get home from the Congress. And part of it was that he, 
he found it very difficult to to look around at other people's families and realize that his his children were growing up essentially in poverty because he couldn't his law practice wasn't bringing in any money anymore so all of their funds they were essentially living off of savings and what small amount they could they could earn from the farm uh, and they were probably eating most of that because they're they couldn't afford food from other sources so it's it's actually a re very desperate financial situation for them um, and so, of course, there's no tutors. There's no there's no ability to hire outside help at this point. There's no um, and so all of the work was being done uh, by Adams. And so the importance of having and uh, John Adams mentions this where he says uh, he, he's frustrated that he can't be at home to attend to his children's education. Uh, so he would have been homeschooling them if he had been if he had been at home. So now all of that is falling on Adams. And this is another, I think, piece of what, what Tocqueville talks about in other parts of his work is the importance of educating women. Because if you don't, you leave them completely bereft if, for example, their husband goes away or if he's called away to war uh, or if he dies. Uh, women need to have that ability to sort of stand on their own two feet. That's echoed also um, in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's Solitude of Self. She makes that, that point as well, that if you don't educate women uh, they will not be able to do the kinds of things that we expect them to do in American life. So the homeschooling was absolutely done by um, Adams. You see some sweet letters that um, Adams writes to Abigail saying, uh, you know, make sure that um, that Johnny is is reading uh, Thucydides. And it would be ideal if he could read it in the ancient Greek, but there's a decent translation that, you know, in my office. <laughs> so, I mean, these are still very well educated people. And, and, and Johnny there he's talking about would be John Quincy Adams, who later becomes president. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. um, who at the age of 10 accompanies his father on a, on a cross Atlantic um, uh, journey. Um, and so this family, again, is just it's a fascinating example of all of these different paradoxes that we see in the American experience, which is this devotion to education, um, a deep religious faith. So all of their letters are infused with a trust in providence and a trust in God. Um, you know, one of the only things that, that seems to support Abigail after the loss of this infant is the fact that she is with God and she's in a better place. Um, but then also just this constant industry and um, and this this just ability to work through whatever is thrown at you, um, and so those those I think it's just such this particular time in in American history I think demonstrates again the way in which those families would work together. The other thing that I think you would absolutely see, um, and this doesn't come out as as much in the letters, but you see it in other historical documents, is that frequently the older children are involved in homeschooling the younger children uh um, throughout the day and so so there's a reciprocity between teaching and learning that happens in that kind of homeschool environment and so it's not just a bunch of people sitting with their peers learning from a superior it's this reciprocal learning and teaching that happens when you're working with younger siblings and then also working with your parent and so on and so forth well, one one uh some one of the folks wants to know and it sounds like what you're saying is uh, is the Adam situation typical for that day and age um, because it's it's sort of how American families are then or is it uh, somehow exceptional? You're, you seem to be suggesting no actually they were much more typical than what we might think and that's how a lot of American families live their lives then. Yes I would say that they're pretty typical um, in the Northeast, the, the South had more aristocratic tendencies. So I think you would see more of that aristocratic culture in familial systems in the South. But certainly in the Northeast and, and also out in the frontier, I think you, you saw this even more in a lot of the, um, the frontier life. And, and there's an interesting sort of pattern, which is that if you look at the states that, for example, where women had the most early political rights, they were typically the frontier states because women were very often left alone for very long periods of time and they had to farm by themselves. They had to be able to be independent and they couldn't rely on men for their legal and political protection. And so I think that that sort of necessity is what bred this, this independence. Certainly the Adams family is unique in a few respects. I mean, um, Abigail Adams was very, very well educated for a woman of her, um, of her position. Her father was, um, uh, was a pastor. Um, and so th this um, education was very much 
part of what attracted them to each other. But as one of the sort of jokes about the Americans go is that you had the Bible and Shakespeare. I mean, the people were, it was a very literate people. And that concept of, of, of education was absolutely central to, uh, to, I think, the American experience, particularly, again, in the Northeast and, and in the frontier area. So I don't think that they would be at all what we would consider um, uh, unique in terms of the role that Abigail plays in, in keeping the family going, but also in the way that they interact with their children. So you've got a family then in, in, in American, in early American history where uh, people live together, people work together, birth happens in the family, education happens in the family. Um, and of course, part of that's just the necessity, you know, there isn't modern technology and those sorts of things, but you also seem to be saying, but it's also something about the family life itself that drew people and kept people together. You have brothers and sisters who, unlike an aristocracy, are not fighting to divide the spoils. They're actually, you know, even if they don't like each other at times, they work together. Tocqueville talks about, in fact, how they, when they get older, they'll, if when siblings get to, together, and I know this is true for a lot of us older siblings, we'll talk about what we did when we were little kids together. And we'll have those shared memories that will be really sweet. And he says, that's really, a powerful bond between people. So we have this family that has these powerful sort of emotional bonds, which he thinks are, as you said, even more natural than the bonds of aristocracy. We have most of the time people are working together. Um, they are educating together and the children, older children are helping with the younger children. They're giving birth in their homes. They're largely dying in their homes. Medical care and health care to the extent it exists is doctors visiting you, not you visiting them. We have this kind of family that persists in America through a lot of crises. We see the strength of it in the American Revolution. We see the strength of that kind of family in the American Civil War. Um, but certainly over time, some of that, the traditional roles of the American family start to change. And a lot of those functions start to move outside the American family. And I know this is something that you've thought a lot about and written about. Could you uh, help us um, understand the, that development and those changes? Yeah, I think probably the biggest factor is, is women moving to work outside of the home. This is the biggest shift that really changes the dynamic of the family. Um, because traditionally, so if, even if you look at Abigail Adams' situation, uh, the people who would be coming to assist her during birth and who would be helping her in the post uh, the postpartum period. And that was a very traditional thing that that female neighbors would do. If your relatives weren't around, your female neighbors would come. Uh, they would help clean up. They would help take care of the baby. They would allow the mother to rest for a week or two um, until she could sort of get back on her feet. And so that sort of female community was incredibly important for allowing those home activities to keep going. Um, especially when women were in the in the midst of childbearing as well, where you have these periods of, of it's very difficult to keep up with your normal sort of activities. So when women start moving outside of the home in large numbers, what you see is a shift away from the usual caretaking tasks that, that women do. Um, and so that makes it makes homeschooling much more difficult if you don't have someone home full time. Um, it, it's also I think important to point out that um, even John Adams would have played a very, very large role in the homeschooling of his children uh, because as a sort of country attorney, he would have had a more flexible schedule. He would have done some of this at night while he was at home or in between cases. And so there, there was no way in which all of this would have fallen on, on one gender in one direction or another. But it's certainly true that when we started moving into primarily office jobs or manufacturing jobs where we have a nine to five workday, that means we are out of the house for long periods of time, homeschooling becomes more difficult. And then once you get women moving into that same work environment, uh, those, those, uh, the ability to be at home and to be doing those kinds of caretaking activities uh, is, is very much gone. And so women would be the primary caretakers of the elderly, they would be the primary caretakers of young children, they would be the primary caretakers, as I've mentioned, of the people giving birth. And that really shifts dramatically when you start having two income, uh, two income homes. And so that I think is the primary social shift. Um, there's a bunch of other things that we can talk about that, that also occur. And, and so part of what we see at the same time 
is the institutionalization of a lot of these traditionally domestic activities. So you see the rise of public schooling in the early 20th century that coincides interestingly with the rise of hospitals. So more and more people start moving into hospitals to give birth, they start moving into hospitals to die. Um, and what's interesting is that as with many social changes, um, a lot of those outcomes were not good at first, the, the outcomes of those institutions, uh, particularly hospitals, when you look at the, the overall death rate, for example, maternal mortality spikes as, as physicians get involved. Um, and so there's costs associated with these, these moves towards institutions. Uh, and I think Tocqueville would say that there's probably also been a cost in terms of the, the intimacy and trust in the family, because people are no longer as involved in the sort of day-to-day -day laboring together that I think he saw was one of the main things that tied families together uh, at the time he's writing. So can you go back to something you said right there? And I know it's work you've done in your latest book. I think this will surprise people a little bit when you said that in the early 20th century, we see the rise of hospitals. And if in the communities where people live around, uh, around the country, including here in Ashland, Ohio, I think that's probably about when our hot local hospital started. And we see uh, the beginnings of, of course, of nurses as a profession, for example, and a kind of shift to um, a more professionalization of doctors and physicians. Normally, we would have thought, well, that must have happened because people thought that would be a lot better for public health, including the health of, of women giving birth. But if I just heard you say, I think that, in fact, in some cases, at least in these early hospitals, it was more dangerous to be in a hospital than to be at home for certain kinds of things. Yes. So um, the the evidence on birth is is the best example of this. Um, and there's actually some, um, it's more anecdotal and more qua uh, qualitative data that comes out of death. Um, but what we know about birth is that when, the, when we had this shift from midwifery care to physician care, uh, we actually had an initial spike in more, uh, maternal mortality. And part of that is due to the fact that midwives uh, traditionally um, were, uh, and, and the traditional midwives were not trained, it was an apprenticeship program, they were not nurses, they didn't have any formal medical training, but they had years and years and years of experience in birth. And generally speaking, for most kinds of birth, uh, the less you do, the better as an attendant. The, the goal is to get the woman's body to work with the baby and to, uh, and there's a variety of interesting sort of research on how that all happens, but midwives would be very good at uh, providing stress relief. Uh, very often, some of the things that they would do is actually come in and just clean the house, give the woman in labor a break from small children hanging off of her. Uh, they would often cook meals. Uh, many of the granny midwives in the South who served primarily African-American populations, uh, they would sit and while the woman was in labor, they would make the first outfit that the baby, they would just sew very patiently the first outfit that the baby would wear. And so the baby would come into the world and have clean clothes to put on. Uh, which is saying a lot in very, very impoverished areas. Um, so the midwives provided both so social and, uh, and a kind of medical support. Uh, what happens is that the physicians, there's this goal or this move to professionalize medicine. And as part of that, uh, there's, a, there's a push to, um, to really expand obstetrics research. And they realize that in order to expand obstetrics research, they need to get women to start giving birth in hospitals because you can't do obstetrics research in individual women's houses as they give birth in all these other kinds of places. You need to get them into hospitals so that you can monitor and quantify the experience. And so what happens then is that uh, women are put into hospitals and very quickly what we find is that a lot of the um, interventions that people, that physicians in particular use, like forceps, um, created very, very high rates of infection. And in fact, infections were one of the primary reasons that you see this spike in maternal mortality at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the early 1900s. And it's because usually male physicians, and sometimes in some cases they're coming straight from doing autopsies to delivering babies and not washing their hands because they don't have adequate sort of hygiene under an adequate understanding of hygiene. So you see this really dramatic um, spike in um, women dying from infections that they would not have otherwise gotten from midwifery care. Um, and th there's similar sorts of stories that come out of uh, dying in hospitals, um, which is that very often dying patients were isolated from their families. Um, they were not told that they were dying. Uh, 
Um, and, and part of the reason, of course, was that they, if you tell people that they're dying, they get scared. And if you allow family members to come in and you say this person's upsetting to other patients and it's upsetting to the overall efficiency of the ward. And so the idea was we've got to isolate people. We've got to keep them separated from their loved ones when they're dying so that they don't sort of interrupt the, the need for the ward to keep moving. Um, and so a lot of the early um, leading up to, I mean, this is actually through the mid part of the 20th century, um, dying in hospitals was enormously isolating and very, very hard for the people who, uh, who were also left behind. Well, it sounds like what happened in some ways is the sort of industrial thinking of the day that was taking over work also took over things like education and healthcare. And, yes. and, brought, and brought some benefit for sure, I, I think we would say, but also you're saying brought some costs with it as well. Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm very happy that we have hospitals. <laughs> I always want to sort of preface that with the uh, hospitals are a wonderful public good. Um, but you're absolutely right that what we actually find, and you can see this in some of the early hospital um, uh, design textbooks, uh, they talk about moving patients through as on a motor car assembly. So this idea of sort of industrialization, this idea of efficiency, this idea of, of creating a kind of factory for humans was part of the, again, many of our earliest theories about education, as well as some of our earliest theories about healthcare, right? The idea was people have something sort of mechanically wrong with them, so let's treat them, their bodies, and move them through this process. And this is one of the reasons that maternity wards in the United States are structured the way that they are. So you typically go in and you're checked out in a triage room and then you're moved to another room to give birth. For a long time, that was a sort of semi-public, almost like a hallway where you sort of labor. And then you were moved after you had the baby to another room and then the baby was separated uh, into another room into a nursery. So it really was the sort of assembly line of, of labor and delivery. And now the more that we know about the physiology of birth, we find that that actually causes a lot of really serious problems. It can slow the process of labor down. It makes labor more painful. Uh, it makes it more difficult for women to handle labor contractions. So there's, there's trade-offs. Uh, you absolutely wanna be in a hospital if you, if you are high risk or you have, um, you have various um, risk factors. But for the average woman, the move to hospital-based birth has come at, at significant costs. And it, there are, I'm, I'm sure at this time, when the, some of these functions are moving uh, out of the home and family to other institutions in society, like, like factories, like hospitals, like schools, there are, of course, some critics of that or some people raising questions. And I know you also had us take a look at a reading from Jane Addams on the Democratic Household, which is written right about that same time, 1902. And... Um, some folks may know Jane Addams and some folks may not know her very well. Could you say a little bit about her and how she sees this, um, this problem or question of what's happening to the American family around this time? Yeah, so, um, so Addams is of course one of the, the major sort of um, uh, members of the, the social branch of the progressive uh, movement who's very concerned about the status of the poor. She's very concerned about the growing inequality between, um, particularly in, in urban areas, between uh, the, um, the rich and the poor. Uh, the, the extension of this essay, actually, she, she has a second part of this essay that deals with um, uh, servant women, right? So this is sort of her concern about what happens to uh, upper class women when they have this kind of education that doesn't link them adequately with the broader uh, social world. Um, so she spends much of her life working with, uh, with the poor in, in a variety of different um, kinds of charities that are very much based on uh, the principles of mutual aid. It's direct assistance to the poor in the communities where they live uh, as a way, interestingly, to sort of try to, insofar as Adams is an interesting character because you can see the, the sort of progressive theories are very much part of her mission. And she talks, for example, um, in this particular reading, uh, she calls, she, she talks about the social claim, right, that, that uh, what we need to sort of reanimate in women is this, this social claim where women are being pulled outside the home 
to assist in bettering their social environments, but they are not adequately educated to do that. Um, so there's this, this concept of the sort of social claim is, is a very progressive kind of idea, but there's a throwback here to Tocqueville in the way that she is thinking about the associations that Americans used to partake in to help each other when they were in need. So if you look at, for example, Abigail Adams, she has a stillborn daughter. She has five young children to take care of, a farm to run. Well, what happens? Her neighbors come in, her sister comes in, right? She has relative, extended relatives who come in from outside. They keep the family from falling into destitution for the two weeks or so that, that Abigail is, is sort of out of commission um, as a result of this. Presumably they also bury the baby, they conduct the funeral rites, and, and this was all mutual aid. She didn't hire people to do this. And one of the criticisms that Adams has of urban life is that we've lost those mutual aid connections. And so people, especially the very poor, no longer have that community to fall back on. And so a single crisis, um, like for example, a stillborn baby, could throw a family into, uh, into destitution, um, depending on how, on, on how um, serious the harm to the mother was. So I think Adam's concern is, um, is very much about the, the way in which urbanization uh, and industrialization has changed the family, has made it more vulnerable, um, and the way in which a lot of these uh, families that used to be independent farmers and or independent business owners are now working for large corporations or, and, and they're just vulnerable in a way that they weren't vulnerable before. So in Adams, I think you see this, this move back toward a kind of concern about um, civil society and civic associations. And she's also critical of the way that especially upper class women are educated. Because if you notice one of the things that she says here uh, in this particular, find this particular quote, um, she says that the, almost it's the second to last paragraph here. Uh, she says, doubtless, it, uh, women's education is at fault in that it has failed to recognize certain needs and has failed to cultivate and guide the larger desires of which all generous young hearts are full. During, and this is the crucial part, during the formative years of life, it gives the young girl no contact with the feebleness of childhood, the pathos of suffering, or the needs of old age. So already at 1902, we've started moving to a sort of isolated family where we don't have the elderly living with families anymore, right? They, there's a, the start of this process of institutionalization is happening, happening um, especially in the upper, um, uh, in the upper class uh, communities. The way that people are educated and the splitting up of public education into grade levels where you only interact with people your same age means that you no longer have that experience of caretaking, that experience of teaching that you would have with a young sibling who you spend most of your time with. And so I think her criticism is actually a sort of Tocquevillian criticism, which is that even by 1902, the family has become isolated. Um, I call it in my book, I talk about the atomic family, that it's the, the sort of, you move from an extended family to a nuclear family to just this very small family that's often composed of just parents and one child. And that, that network of people and connections that used to buffer people is no longer there. And so I think that's her concern about what's happening to the urban poor, and that's her concern about specifically what's happening in the education of the elites, is that they, they cannot feel sympathy for the urban poor because they're not being taught sympathy in the family to begin with. Hmm. So if we, if we fast forward, it looks like the 20th century, um, if anything, it sort of accelerated those trends of, of taking um, work, education, healthcare, um, intergenerational living outside of the home and family to institutions outside of it. It sort of accelerated that. But now we've got this crisis. And now kids are at home. Now parents are at home. Work in many ways for, for those who are able to work from home has shifted back to home. Teachers who are joining us now, no doubt are still teaching their students, but they're doing it in very different ways, probably from home. So um, a lot of folks have been asking questions is this moment uh, 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 in our history a time where do you think we'll see any reevaluation of this trend? We have seen some movement toward things like um, 
uh, in home births. There's been some movement like that. There's been some movement, obviously, toward homeschooling before all this started. But do you see this crisis as somehow um, helping us to think back toward that view of family and family life in America? Uh, do you see that happening? And if so, will that be a good thing or a bad thing? And that's what a lot of folks are interested in. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, anecdotally, at least, I think that we are seeing some some real conversations happening. Um, and I'm seeing this mostly in terms of uh, social media posts or news stories where people are looking at and interviewing uh, parents, for example, who are home with their kids. And one thing that that um, I've noticed among parents is this um, sort of thankfulness for the ability to slow down. So there's a lot of stress, first of all. You have a lot of two, you know, du uh, dual parent households, for example, where both people are working full time and they're also taking care of young children. So it's, it's a stressful situation. Um, you have parents who are out of jobs. So financially, I think this is going to be crushing for a lot of people. And I'm seeing conversations uh, already about what this means for our social safety net, right? If our social safety net is adequate, if we have, if we've lost the kind of associational safety net that that Abigail Adams had, what what are we replacing it with if we don't have that anymore? So I think those kinds of questions are going to be are going to be important. Culturally, though, I think we are seeing, we've already been seeing the shift. So home births are are rising across the nation. Uh, they're they're actually dramatically increasing during this period because of fears about whether hospitals are safe uh, to give birth. So I think you're already seeing that happen, and I think that trend will continue. Um, homeschooling in general is increasing uh, and has been increasing steadily over the last um, uh, 10 or so years. So I think we're going to start seeing more of that. Um, people, though, that I that I know who homeschool uh, have have sort of noted caution, which is please don't think that what we are doing right now is homeschooling in the sense of trying to sort of limp through without a curriculum, without a lesson plan, without adequate preparation. And without the ability to take kids outside and go places. So most homeschoolers would say, you know, this is not the homeschooling that we do, right? We go to parks and we go to um, the zoo and we have Latin lessons with other kids in the neighborhood, right? And so it's an incredibly social kind of um, kind of thing. And so, so it, it's not fair to compare what we're doing now with what homeschoolers do in real life. But I think one of the things that, that people are coming, or one of the things that I'm hearing at least, uh, is a, a sort of happiness that there is at least a home to come home to and a sense of, of peace at the, that, that sort of sense of intimacy and trust is coming back. So for the first time, people are actually looking at how their children learn, for example. Um, they're trying to see in, in real time sort of what teachers are doing in the classroom and then sort of adapting those to their children. Um, I'm seeing some parents concerned for the first time about the amount of homework and schoolwork that children have. And maybe children should be spending more time playing and outside than doing some of the work that we are requiring um, in public schools. So I think some of the reasons that people are homeschooling are becoming more obvious as parents are now in the throes of trying to figure out how to navigate uh, the shift from public education to whatever we're doing right now, which is not really homeschooling in the traditional sense. <laughs> and but, so a question would come up then, though, has the American family changed so much that it, it, it will it be possible for us once schools, there are probably schools, at least in Ohio, are not going to start up again this year. But let's say that they start up again in the fall as they, they, they look like they may, at least around in lots of places around the country. Um, Will this persist, or has the American family, in your view, changed so much that people are grateful for this moment to slow down, but they're looking to speed up again? They're looking to for, for when their kids can go back to school. They're looking, and they're not looking at this as a opportunity for a permanent change that will affect society. Yeah, I don't think I don't think the current crisis will be determinative in in one way or another. What I do think, though, is that the trends that we saw before the crisis began will continue after the crisis. And those trends are a move toward bringing people back home. So a move toward having the elderly move back in with relatives. 
uh, a move toward more homeschooling. Um, a lot of people are playing with part-time homeschooling. So a lot of districts have actually opened it up that you can do a sort of blended or hybrid approach because they're getting pressure from taxpayers. I don't want my kid in school full time, but I want to be able to send them for maybe two days a week or something like that. So I think we're starting to see people realize the importance of, and I know from, from a personal perspective, both of my parents worked. I grew up in daycare and then um, and then in public school my whole life. Uh, and that that experience deeply affected the way that I think about child rearing. Um, and it's no blame on my parents, but I, I felt a deep longing for home throughout my childhood. And I think a lot of people who are raised in that 80s, 90s kind of uh, sort of uh, industrial factory kind of um, way of life where we, we all work outside the home and everybody sort of goes into an institution during the day. Um, I think a lot of people are tired of institutions. They're tired of, of living their lives sort of surrounded by anonymous people uh, or sort of acquaintances. And so there's a deep sort of longing for that intimacy and connection that Tocqueville talks about in that original family. So I think that's part of the reason that we see this expanded interest in homeschooling and expanded interest in home birth. Um, one of the biggest um, uh, growth recently has been in hospice, bringing people back home to die so that they can be in a familiar environment, so that they can be taken care of by people who love them. And that has exploded over the last um, 20 or 30 years. So I think all of those signs point to a rejection of the sort of institutionalization of family life and at least some attempt at rediscovering what it means to come home. We've, one, one question has been raised about that, and you mentioned the importance, uh, Tocqueville talks about it for Americans of faith and religious faith and the practice of it in their houses. And of course, a lot of people in this current situation, uh, folks who may uh, attend church or synagogue, they are not able to do that by and large in most places, at least not yet. And so we've seen a lot of, um, you know, uh, even my family going going to church, but online. Um, so, a person asked a question: Do you think that there may be some revival of religiosity or religious uh, elements within families as a result of this crisis? Because again, it's not going out to church; it's sort of doing church or or your faith in in the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually not sure how this is going to affect. Um, I, I do think that that typically when in times of fear and sort of uncertainty, I think we do tend to uh, to come back to a faith in, in something greater than ourselves. Um, I think it's worth noting that, that one of the reasons that you see over and over again in, for example, survey data about why people want to homeschool or why people want to, for example, um, uh, do home hospice uh, is because of faith considerations. Uh, or a belief that uh, that that there isn't enough of the moral content, um, whatever that moral content looks like, um, in these institutions. And so I do think that um, I mean, I, I feel a deep longing to get back to uh, get back to church in a physical sense. So that this has been very difficult, I think, for a lot of people in a lot of different faith communities is to be separated from each other in this kind of way. Um, and I think I think it's possible that we will see a, a sort of gratitude when we can eventually come back together uh, that 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 will sort of instigate some kind of uh, increase in, in faith overall. Well, let's hope that time is sooner rather than later. <laughs> let's all hope so. <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much. This has been so interesting. And it's a it's a it's a question uh, that we're living <laughs> today. And so I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join with us today. I know we have so many questions from folks that we weren't able to get to, but hopefully we addressed some of them and hopefully got a chance to talk about some big and important ideas and issues uh, that are on people's minds today. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. Of course. And folks, I just want to again say if, if you want to learn more about the Ashbrook Center, um, please check out our website, ashbrook.org tells you all about what the center is and the kind of programs that we're running around the country for students, teachers, and citizens. And also, um, if you're interested in finding resources on American history and civics, uh, please check out teachingamericanhistory.org, T-A-H.org. A lot of our teacher friends and partners who are out there now 
know that website. It's a fantastic resource. It's the largest collection of primary source uh, American historical documents in the nation, uh, over 2,500 of them. So if you, again, if you're a parent or a grandparent or a friend who's involved in homeschooling right now, teaching kids, or if you're a teacher who's doing your great work online now, um, please avail yourself of those resources. Check it out, tah.org. Uh, it's a wonderful resource. And uh, we will also be, of course, sending recording today's uh, webinar, and we'll be sending folks a link of that recording. And please, if you want to listen to this again, if there's something you missed, if there's some particular thing you want to think about again and listen to, or share with your family, share with your friends, please do so. We would be delighted by that, and we'll be sending you that. Our, our next, I'm really excited to talk about a little bit about our next series. You know, we're, we're going through this Insights uh, from History series. Our next series, I'm delighted to announce today, is through the month of May, we're going to be focusing uh, our series called American Heroes. And we're going to take a moment to focus on Americans who maybe you've heard of or maybe you haven't heard of. And if you've heard of them, some of them you know, but maybe you don't know the full story. Maybe you don't know all there is to know about these really amazing and interesting Americans who have done important things for our country. So we want to take some time in the month of May to, to meet some great people from our past, to hear their great stories and their inspiring stories, and get a deeper insight on what it takes to be a hero, what it means to be a hero um, in moments of crisis and in, in moments of importance in American history. So we want to take some time and, and we want to have the kind of webinar conversations that we had so wonderfully today with Dr. Hall. And the topics will be, I think, really interesting to folks. We're going to talk about um, heroes of the American founding and what kind of people, a little bit like we talked about today, did it take to successfully conduct a revolution and then actually build a government out of that? One of the great successes in, in world history. A lot of revolutions don't end well, as we know, but the American Revolution ends well. And how is that so? Uh, another topic we want to talk about is American war heroes. To take a step back to, to look at some really impressive lives of folks who have served and sacrificed for our country and, and take a look at those. How did ordinary people do extraordinary things in times of life and death situations? We want to talk about heroes of American business. You know, what does it take to start a business, to create something like that, and then run it in really difficult times? Again, the sort of problems that we see today confronting folks in business. And then heroes of American medicine. We talked a little bit about this with Dr. Hall today, but we want to focus on a few of those folks who, you know, what does it take to care for the sick in a crisis in the way that Dr. Hall talked about today? And what about those who have discovered vaccines? We want to tell the story of some Americans who have discovered vaccines. And of course, that's a really important and pressing question on people's minds today. So please, we'll, we'll be sending out information on this, but I just want to give you a, a little preview of the webinar series we're going to be doing called American Heroes. It's going to be wonderful, great conversations with national members of our national Ashbrook faculty. And so we want to invite you to that. Put that on your calendars for May. For next week, we're going to be joined in the last of our webinars for this series with Dr. Melissa Mathis. Um, she is at the United States Coast Guard Academy and also in Ashbrook's uh, Teaching American History and Master's program. She's going to be talking about the power of the pulpit during a national crisis from Pearl Harbor to the coronavirus. Once we're going to talk about the role of religious leaders and religious groups in times of great crisis in America, and we'll look at events like Pearl Harbor, we'll look at events like Vietnam and 9-11, and we're going to look at some sermons by ministers such as uh, Howard John Wesley and Billy Graham. So it's going to be a wonderful conversation on this really important topic of the role of communities of faith in times of in crisis in American history. Just as we had such a wonderful time today talking with Dr. Hall about the role of American family in times of crisis. I want to thank you for coming. I thank Dr. Hall again for a wonderful conversation. And I hope all of you, as always, will stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay connected with Ashbrook. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you next week.